Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast. Oh gosh, it's it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. You leave me no choice. It comes the smolder. Wait, you like that? No. Why do you like that? No, I don't like that. No, how about that? You like that? Uh, a little better. Bread makes you fat? Does this count as annoying? Just tell me what you want me to fuck. Not you, not you, and not you. Okay, I think it's time to take off your clothes and jump me. A million dollars isn't cool. You know what's cool? I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast, the podcast that focuses on one year of movies every single year, and this year we are tackling 2010. And with me today is my regular co-host, Emily. Hello, everyone. And our infrequent, but still very important, co-host, Matt. (laughs) Hey, what's going on? Feeling important today. (laughs) Good. Well, I mean, you you have to be because you're our expert when it comes to New York. So you're going to tell us how authentic this movie was. Great. Just wanted to give a quick shout out. Thank you to those people who did rate us on Spotify. We finally reached that mark where now we know that we are getting five star ratings from people. It says a little number 12 next to that now because we have 12 <gasps> people rate us. Oh, my gosh. Nice. Last time I looked, it said 11. Yeah. What? That's pretty cool. Amazing. Thank you for doing that. Uh, please continue to do that if you haven't done so. Uh, we really appreciate that. But we'll stop plugging so hard at the start of every episode now, now that we've gotten to that goal that we had set gotten for ourselves. over the hump. That's right. Before we talk about the other guys, Ben, do you have a special cocktail of sorts for this movie? I do. Mark Wahlberg and I are very similar. We're both peacocks. You got to let us fly. <laughs> so I made a peacock inspired drink. It's going to be a gin and tonic with a splash of blue curacao and lime juice in it. Okay, Ooh. I can see the the blue and the it's got green the color look. Yeah, although lime juice is not green, but I'll I'll, I'll allow it. My lime juice is green. <laughs> okay, I got like the concentrate stuff that comes. Oh, in Oh, okay. I yeah. just assumed you squeezed lime in, but you know, whatever. It's gonna be better than Matt's, no matter what. Great job, Matt. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> wow. Well, I have a uh, Coca Cola, right? And it was bought from the guy with the hot dog cart who said free hot dogs for life for (laughs) Samuel Jackson and Dwayne the Rock Johnson, uh, but no free drinks. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I feel (laughs) like that's a joke that could be lost later on in the show, but I really enjoyed that little fun tidbit. (laughs) So drinking a Coke today, one dollar. Hey, stupid inflation, man. (laughs) That's cheap. That's cheap. It's two dollars on a lot of places. Oh, my God. Well, Emily, what do you got? I know you're going to blow us both out of the water. OK, well, way to set that up. I'm drinking a dirty iced tea and the boys. I'm having some iced tea and have some honey whiskey in it with some lime juice or no lemon juice. Excuse me. And of course, got to pay homage to our lovely narrator and our lovely director and the boys, obviously. So very nice. Thank you. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> Yum. This movie, The Other Guys, is available to stream for not too much longer. I believe it's only on Netflix until June 30th, which my Netflix immediate was like, hey, last day to stream this. Heads up. OK, thanks, Netflix. But we appreciate you having it at all. So thank you. For that. <laughs> That's that does true. make our job a lot easier. <laughs> yes. If I were a lion and you were a tuna, I would swim out in the middle of the ocean and freaking eat you. And then I'd bang your tuna girlfriend. Okay. First off, a lion swimming in the ocean? Lions don't like water. If you'd placed it near a river or some sort of fresh water source, that makes sense. But you find yourself in the ocean, 20-foot waves, I'm assuming it's off the coast of South Africa, coming up against a full-grown 800-pound tuna with his 20 or 30 friends? You lose that battle. You lose that battle nine times out of ten. And guess what? You've wandered into our school of tuna, and we now have a taste of lion. We've talked to ourselves. We've communicated and said, you know what? Lion tastes good. Let's go get some more lion. We've developed a system to establish a beachhead and aggressively hunt you and your family. And we will corner your your pride, your children, your offspring. How are you going to do that? We will construct a series of breathing apparatus with kelp. We will be able to trap certain amounts of oxygen. It's not going to be days at a time but an hour, 
Hour 45, no problem. That will give us enough time to figure out where you live, go back to the sea, get more oxygen, and then stock you. You just lost your own game. You're outgunned and outmanned. Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope. The other guys is at 78% on Rotten Tomatoes and made $170 million at the box office in 2010. And it's directed and written by Adam McKay, who got his start as a writer on SNL in 1995 and a year later was named as SNL head writer. He is also a frequent collaborator with our main star of this movie, which is Will Ferrell, who started on SNL at the same time as McKay and went on to collaborate with him in movies like Anchorman, Talladega Nights, and Step Brothers. They also both co-founded the website Funny or Die and started Gary Sanchez Productions, uh, which went on to make shows like Eastbound and Down, Drunk History, Secession, and then nearly every Will Ferrell movie of the 2010s. I did not know they made Funny or Die. That makes so much more sense to me now. <laughs> well, especially with The Landlord, that was funnier, one of Funnier Die's like first major videos that got a lot of play. Dream Team right there. Is that Adam <laughs> Kay's daughter too? It is. That's like an article waiting to happen. Like, where is she now? And she's just like <laughs> going to college or whatever it is. Uh, fuck. Came out so long ago. But yeah, that's the dream team right there. I didn't, I, you had no sleepers on that list. I think the only thing I've seen is the landlord and this movie. So, <laughs> wow. <woo>. wow. <laughs> you should check out those other Will Ferrell movies. Those are really good. We'll definitely talk about that in a little bit. But also in this movie is Mark Wahlberg, who is head of the Funky Bunch. Uh, he, he gained rap notoriety in the 90s for his song Good Vibrations, before going on to star in hit movies like The Perfect Storm, Three Kings, Boogie Nights, and The Italian Job. And really only one comedy movie prior to this one, which was I Heart Huckabees. He was in that. He played the fireman. Oh, God, I don't really remember it other than Wesley like saying, you have to watch this. And I watched it and I don't really remember anything but Lily <laughs> Tomlin. <laughs> that is so a Wesley movie to recommend. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> there are many others in this movie also, including Steve Coogan, Michael Keaton, Ava Mendez, Damon Wayans Jr., and special appearances by The Rock and Samuel L. Jackson. Fun times, fun times, and an extra special fun time is going to be had by all of us because I, weirdly enough, had seen this movie before Ben did. So of all the Adam McKay movies out there, this is the only one I believe Ben had never seen. And I figured, you know what? Might as well let Ben take on the plot synopsis prediction today. Good luck, Ben. I'm sure it'll be tricky with, you know, the other guys. I'm surprised you've ne you haven't seen it. Yeah, um, just never got around to it. It never really piqued my interest. But I did know that the name of the movie was obviously The Other Guys and that it was a buddy cop movie. And I knew that uh, Wahlberg and Will Ferrell were in it. So I assumed there are cops who are good at their job and there are the other guys. And Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg are the other guys, bumbling idiots who fell ass backwards into police work, but now have to prevent the greatest copycat crime the world has ever known preventing the stealing of the Declaration of Independence, like in <laughs> National Treasure. Wow. Uh, this also stars Andy Samberg as a celebrity impersonator who thinks he is Nicolas Cage. <laughs> that would have been fucking great. And then it's, it's all about will Will and Mark mark the end of the crazed plot, or will they succumb to the temptation of a more thrilling life after infiltrating the heist group? <laughs> all right, all Close. right, all right. Pretty close. It's not too bad. I, I, I at least got the, the, the reason for it being called the other guys right, I think. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yep. But what was this movie actually about, Matt, based on what it says on the DVD cover? Ooh. Uh, okay. So the misfit NYPD detectives Gamble and Holt. Uh, that's, uh, you know. Captain Holt. Uh, that's, I had Holt in my brain from Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's the uh, Marky Mark and Will Ferrell right there are sentenced to life behind the desk. They hate each other and the monotony of their meaningless jobs as they are forced to live in the shadow of the two biggest and most badass cops on the force. Those guys go down for the count. That's really funny. <laughs> and uh, opportunity knocks for Gamble and Hoyts. There's one more sentence You're on the second page. Skip the last two lines. <laughs> <sighs> how, how could it end so perfectly? And have one more line. All right. 
<laughs> for anybody that's listening, the the next line goes on the next page, so fuck me. <laughs> Stumbling onto what could be the biggest crime in years, can the other guys step up their game to solve the case without killing each other and destroying NYC in the process? Okay, hang on. I didn't, they don't even, I didn't need that last sentence. <laughs> they don't even destroy as much as Samuel L. Jackson and The Rock. Like, come on. Right. Whatever. <laughs> There's barely any property damage. <laughs> I'm really glad I didn't read this plot summary before I watched the movie because the surprise of The Rock and Samuel L. Jackson dying was one of my favorite parts <laughs> of the movie. And it completely ruins that in this synopsis. Yeah, those assholes. Yeah. Plus, I feel like Will Ferrell's character actually really enjoys his job. He seems pretty happy about it. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel monotonous to him like or meaningless what he does. Like He's happy he's to be doing paperwork. That's what he wants. Yeah, but you got to generalize everybody in a DVD plots synopsis, right? I guess, but you don't, also don't want to misrepresent what your movie's about. Yeah, they could have they could, they could been way more vague and still gotten the point across like, Bitch, Will Ferrell's on the cover. What do you think's going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have to know because I have only seen this movie and The Landlord, obviously. Which of Will Ferrell's and Adam McKay's movies are like top tier, like the best? Ooh, well, I would recommend Talladega Nights or Step Brothers because you know... If you like it, there's another one that's like pretty much the same thing. Same two actors just waiting in the wings. Anchorman's still really good. And Steve Carell is like, he's so fucking good as Brick, the idiot. Mm -hmm. I just rewatched Anchorman. But overall, I don't know. I, I think the Talladega Nights and Step Brothers is the better of the three. I will say this of the, the four that we're talking about, the other guys was my least favorite. So okay. I really do think that you're not going to go wrong with any of those other three. The first time I saw Step Brothers, I didn't like it. It's a movie that really grew on me because I was kind of tired of the Will Ferrell shtick at, by the time I saw that one, which <laughs> is why so I good. think I didn't see the other guys was because I was like, I'm, I'm done with you. Like, I'm, I'm sick of this. You're the same character in every movie just about. But Anchorman, I watched earlier this week, and that movie is maybe one of the most quotable movies to ever be released. Like literally every <laughs> line that comes out is something that you could pull just a sound bite of and play it after someone says something on a podcast. It's okay. incredible. And there's a lot more cameos of like famous people in Anchorman that are what? like fantastic lines, you know? I felt like this movie had so many cameos and so many Anchorman, fun lines. I think has more. Wow. Yeah. You got like Vince Vaughn, Luke Wilson. Uh, that's just the fight. Anchorman is it is one where it, seriously, Emily. Like when this podcast is done, stop what you're doing, whatever you have <laughs> planned, and watch Anchorman. <laughs> it's like a tight ninety minute movie, and it is so funny. Well, then maybe Matt can be on for educating Emily sometime and make me watch it. I think that's that's a good idea. Hmm. <laughs> mm. Well, I was just curious because I don't know much about Adam McKay's humor, and I've never really been a Will Ferrell fan, I guess. And I think that's partially because I didn't watch a lot of SNL growing up, but I know Ben did. Yeah. Matt, were you really into SNL when you were kind of in your high school days or earlier? I'm half and half. You know, I've seen a lot of the famous sketches, and I'm very familiar with those eras of SNL, but I've since sort of stopped watching. I said just a little bit ago that like all Will Ferrell character, all Will Ferrell character, blah, blah, <laughs> get that poison out. Blah. <laughs> all Will Ferrell characters are basically the same person. They're like this overconfident, cocky person when they shouldn't be because they don't ha necessarily have any of the skills to back it up. And this movie is like the opposite of that, where he starts off as this like not confident person. And I found it really interesting to be able to see a different will ferrell character than i'm used to so okay. that that is something i did appreciate about this movie 100 percent, yeah were his characters in snl also very similar to this or to his prior movies um, yeah but that's that's what i think of you know when he's like the cheerleader uh you know banging on the cowbell yep the night at the um, roxbury guy right yeah they are kind of all similar to that but if I mean, if you got a shtick and you're good at it, keep doing it. Like, 
You can also play the straight man. I mean, look at the landlord. You know, he's just getting beat up. I think he does that really well, too. I find it so interesting because I think the only Will Ferrell movies I've seen besides the other guys now is Elf. But I think I saw Stranger Than Fiction first. And so Mm -hmm. (laughs) I guess I don't know a lot about this humor and why it works. I mean, I think it's funny for sure, but I could see that it it would get old after a while. You know, how how do you keep it fresh in a way? And, you know, with Adam McKay directing and doing a lot of the writing in collaboration with Will Ferrell, I guess I was just curious about why, why is it funny? You know, (laughs) in in a broad sense. (laughs) Well, I mean, why is it funny is tough to, I I mean, it's like, there's so many like nuances and stuff, but I think to your point earlier about like, how do you keep it fresh? I don't necessarily know that this has like an infinite, you know, timeline for, because like Ben was saying, the reason he didn't see this film is because he was sick of the the shtick. So don't overdo it, I guess. <laughs> but he's he's fantastic. And like even like interviews he does, he sort of just plays this straight man, but he's still like electrically funny. So Well, he's really smart because he puts people around him that are almost able to steal scenes from him. Like he's like the the grounding force of a lot of the scenes in terms of his character. But then it's the people around him who are allowed to be funny and steal the scene from him, like an anchor man. Like the Will Ferrell's character has some funny lines in that, but you talk about like Brick, you talk about Brian Fantanas, which is Paul Rudd's character. Like there are some serious funny lines coming from other people in those movies. And John C. Riley in Talladega Nights and Step Brothers is like the perfect balance to him because they're both very similar. So mm-hmm. that they can almost switch off between who's the straight man and who's the absurd one and just like I'll like toss the ball back and forth because both characters are equally crazy. <laughs> I, f- I feel that is a really good description of Mark Wahlberg's character and Will Ferrell's character. <laughs> Wahlberg gets close. Like, it, it, it's very surprising to see him in a role like this, because like I said earlier, he isn't a comedian. Like, he's not a comedic guy in the movies that he's been in. So then asking him to step in and play this straight man, but also have some just batshit plot lines and stuff like his. I learned those those skills so that I can make fun of other people. Right. That's crazy. Or his excessive anger issues to the point where he he doesn't make sense. He's not coherent whatsoever. Everyone's just like, wait, what? What are you saying? This doesn't make any sense. And I feel like uh, I feel like Mark Wahlberg definitely got his uh, chops in, in terms of comedy uh, by 2010. You know, he was on, you know, SNL and he'd done I Heart Huckabees and stuff. So I don't think he was like a slouch at all i want to go ahead and say that because like i thought he had some pretty great lines that were like i think him and um the police chief uh michael keaton hmm. they they had a lot of great interactions where it was like i don't think will ferrell was in the scene so i was i just want to make sure we're representing mark Wahlberg well is- sure but it's not like he's headlined a comedy up until now like i heard huckabee's is a comedy maybe in name only like because that movie is very serious in tone right but I mean, he he did have a proclivity for comedy because even in movies like The Departed, he's got some really funny lines in that movie in a movie that's very serious. He's got this this hidden talent, and I, I was happy to see him flourish in this one and then gain a lot more comedic roles after this when mm-hmm. you think of like uh, Ted, Pain and Gain. Oh my God, I forgot about Daddy's that Daddy's Home. Like he, he goes on to have this great 2010s of comedy movies because of this launching point. Right. Daddy's home. That one's good. He's good in it. The movie's <laughs> not very good. <laughs> okay. All right. I haven't seen it. I think it's time to talk about our favorite things about this, though. Okay. Unless there's anything else you want to say. I mean, I kind of just teased my winning because my winner is Mark Wahlberg in this movie, and it's for all really? the reasons I just listed. Do you have some favorite moments? I mean, his peacock line reading is incredible. But then also just him being able to do the action star thing, but in a comedic way. Like there's this movie steals a lot from other action comedies and and it's kind of a satire of those buddy cop movies that you Mm -hmm. got in the 80s and 90s like Rush Hour or or um, Lethal Weapon, those types of movies. 
and seeing him just go toe to toe with Will Ferrell, who's this comedic juggernaut. Like, how do you how do you stand there listening to that to that lion tuna rant and not just bust out laughing <laughs> like that's great acting for him not to just ruin every single take of that right yeah we would hunt your lion pride we'd figure out how to get air <laughs> maybe not for a day but one two hours we kill it it's so funny or even just him being like you you were a pimp like as 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 will ferrell's <laughs> telling the story he's like no you, you I were wasn't a pimp, a pimp. <laughs> Did you stay listening. for the credits and watch the uh, outtake at the end? I did what? not. Yeah, the, on the Netflix version, at least, there was an outtake at the end where, you know, they're at the Japanese restaurant and he's like, can you get the check? And Will Ferrell like turns and he says like, Zhuzhuba! and then, like they both crack up because like he doesn't know Japanese. <laughs> <Right. or whatever. laughs> yeah, Mark Wahlberg, super great, though. I absolutely agree. And I loved a lot of the acting in this. There were some really great cameos and there were some great people. But I think for me, Michael Keaton is what won me over for this movie. I've always loved Michael Keaton. Uh, I think the first thing I actually saw him in was Mr. Mom, which is, you know, a movie from the 80s. (laughs) And just seeing him in a comedic role when he himself was a stand-up comedian, which I didn't know until actually like reading oh, I didn't a little bit either. more about this movie and just watching some interviews and people talking about how great he was. McKay even said like, you know, he knew Michael Keaton from his stand-up days, just like loving his his material. But he always wins my heart over, I think, the way he deadpans stuff and just like talks normally how he does in so many other things just like i'm just casual about this and he just says so many funny things and i think one of my favorite scenes is probably the bed bath and beyond second job where he's talking to everyone and doing a briefing and it turns out that it's bed bath and beyond and you don't catch it until they like pull back and see everyone (laughs) and it's just so (laughs) fucking funny and then he like pulls out that oh and there's a rapist on this neighborhood and he goes oh wait that's from my second job (laughs) you know (laughs) just the shit he says and the way that he delivers it was so fucking funny to me and i i thought he outshone everyone honestly that tlc stuff was really good too yeah he was yeah no scrubs (laughs) you know you're doing tlc lyrics i'm gonna creep (laughs) creep (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a lot of he had a lot of good stuff. Yeah, because this this followed like five years where he wasn't in much. Mm -hmm. Coming back in in a small supporting comedic role is like uh, just a great move for him. The only other movie he had in this in like a 10 year frame between 2005 and 2014 is this one and the voice of Ken in Toy Story 3. Oh, my God, that's right. (laughs) Yes, I do remember that. It was Perfect. Matt, did you have a winner? I think for me, um, it was the uh, Steve Coogan, specifically the gag where he kept on bribing them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. (laughs) Yep. So good. Like, this movie doesn't take itself seriously. Um, You know, multiple times it cuts away to, you know, (laughs) our detectives at the Jersey Boys or like (laughs) courtside and. It's so good, but Steve Coogs, he's great. And, um, you know, ever since I got more into his stuff, rewatching this, I was able to appreciate some of the humor and stuff he was doing a lot more. My favorite movie he does is Ham- Hamilton 2. Hamlet nope. 2. Hamilton 2. I, I Hamlet swear two. the Excuse second me. time <laughs> Matt has made this mistake on this podcast, I'm almost positive. <laughs> Hamilton 2. Do, do another one, Coogs. Redo <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> and i think that this whole movie is filled with so many great moments i think we should just list them off and just go through a bunch of them i'll start the bye sheila back and forth when he's like bye terry i don't think he heard me bye sheila that shit makes me laugh so fucking hard <laughs> they're so far away from each other and they just keep going and honestly i think adam mckay probably just let it keep rolling for a really long time to the point where like this is getting excessive, but it still keeps on getting fucking funny. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I guess another gag that's really good is uh, Will Ferrell telling all the sexual things you would have to do to his wife when he <laughs> dies the next day to her mother. Yeah. <laughs> so she's like, I don't want to say. And so tell me what she said. <laughs> she said that you, you want to sweat together and lick each other. It was like graphic, but really funny. <laughs> I like the the disgrace that Mark Wahlberg experienced was something so absurd as him shooting Derek Jeter. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I know you already mentioned it, Ben, but that tuna fish versus lion improv, the fact that that's just fucking improv, just going, going nuts. I didn't know it was improv. It was still funny, but just learning that Will Ferrell just does this shit with Adam McKay, I, I didn't realize that. And it was so funny. Do you know, let's say uh, definitely The Rock and Samuel Jackson jumping off the, <laughs> the building, aim for the bushes, and then they both kill themselves. <laughs> and the, even the funeral was funny. They're like, wait, there was nothing down there. Like, why would they? <laughs> and the Ice Cube narration, we haven't even talked about that. I, ice uh, Cube narrating. Ice, ice tea. Ice tea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can't hold up a glass with ice cubes and ice tea in it and expect him to know which one you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I love that the needle drop into them jumping off the roof is Foo Fighters hero because yes. as soon as the song started playing, I'm like, oh my God, they're going to jump. Like I, <laughs> it, it, the needle drop telegraphed what was going to happen and it didn't make it any less funny because watching them fall for so long to like the depth <laughs> that they show of how far he falls and Samuel L. Jackson's body slowly getting like more and more out of control. <laughs> As it's getting to the <laughs> ground, it was just hilarious. You know, speaking of the funeral for them, the fight scene where they're quiet and they're just hitting <laughs> and punching each other and like crowding around them to block everyone else's view and whispering. Oh my God. I fucking loved that. Yeah, Rob Riggle after the fight's like, I won. I won. <laughs> <laughs> you all saw it. I won. <laughs> Uh, we didn't even talk about any of the action sequences yet. Pretty good. Would you like, especially like that conference room, uh, Mark Wahlberg sliding across the glass <laughs> on his back, you know, over the top, a choice they made. He's like, f he's like slingshot across the table, but it was like really well done. And I love the, just the papers everywhere. I don't know how that would be quite uh, undertaking to film that, but it was great. No, the action scenes were very well done, and especially the beginning, the opening one with The Rock and, and Samuel L. Jackson. I mm -hmm. thought that was a really interesting take on one, a comedic take on an action sequence to get us into this world that we're going to be um, living in for the next hour and a half. Yeah, I think for me, they had so much absurd and ludicrous humor that was partnered with more serious fight scenes and, and practical effects with action scenes where... The humor around it was funny, but the action was serious in, in terms of it was well executed and well done, you know, with even the zip line, the chase scenes, the moment when, you know, you had this giant explosion, which also was hilarious. You had the helicopter <laughs> with the golfers, like all of these <laughs> yeah. were really great choices and were executed so well, like they were very serious about their stunt work. And I really valued that in this movie. My favorite sequence of the entire movie from a filmmaking standpoint is the Amabi scene. where They play <laughs> the Black Eyed Peas stuff because that scene should have been like in a different movie would have been a montage of just like them doing different things at the party. But doing it in this like pseudo montage way where you're using like a single flowing shot but then still images of the actors to show the progression of the night. It's just a really creative way of doing that. And I really appreciated right. that type of creativity. Question about that. How does one do something like that? It's somewhere on YouTube. I remember watching this movie again and being like, how the fuck did they do this? <laughs> same, <laughs> same sort of like, wait, but this is cool. Um, but I know it's on YouTube somewhere. It'd be doing compositing. Where okay. basically you, you have like a break where you can cut the, the film back together of a scene. Like, so they, they kind of overlap each other with the film where, okay, we're going to film you guys in the spot and then the rest of the bar is empty and then you just stack it up on top. Right. But how do you make sure the camera's in the same place? Well, I'm, it's a tracking shot. So you can do 
choreography or a dolly work. Oh, he's supposed to be on a track. Yeah. I love that Ben, the one that doesn't have any camera experience. <laughs> well, I think it's I think it's like like Ben said, compositing, but I think they overlay multiple sort of clips with uh I gotta go watch. <laughs> I gotta go I gotta go see. Maybe I'll have something for you next time I'm on. Also, I'm a bee's a complete banger. I love that song. It is such a good <laughs> song. <laughs> there there were so many other things too that like I just want to list off a couple of other of my favorite throwaway gags that ended up being really memorable to me. I think the negotiation failure is probably one of my favorite moments when you see, I don't remember his name, but they're the lawyer, Steve Coogan's lawyer falls off and lands on the cart below. And Will Ferrell's like, he's flying. <laughs> they're just so bad at negotiating. It was so <laughs> funny. The scene where the red Prius was found and I don't remember the actor's name, but I know he's super famous in so many comedic things. And he's like, it's a fucking soup kitchen in there. <laughs> and then the note from dirty Mike and the boys, which becomes later a later gag, you know, they have a freaking orgy in it. <laughs> We're going to have sex in your car again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so many great moments. And I I just really loved those pieces separately. <laughs> How do you guys think the critique or representation of the Bertie Madoff stuff played off? Because I didn't even realize that that's what they were doing until the credits started rolling and they showed all the graphics of the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. Like I didn't even pick up on that. That's what they were doing. You're going to have to describe things a little bit more because Emily's clueless. I'm assuming you're talking about Wall Street or something. It's a Wall Street thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think those two things fit, you know, because it's like just straight fraud, you know, to repay an investor, Ben. So I agree. I think that the credit sequence is a little out of left field for this particular film. But I think the reason we pick up on it so hard is because of how well done the credit sequence was, because it has a lot of information about Ponzi scheme, how much money is stolen, how it happens. And it's all like visually amazing it's like i don't think it fits with the film either though because that's not what steve coogan was doing you right. know and emily i'm not the person to educate on you on, <laughs> on bernie madoff or or what happened um that's other okay. than he, he ran a ponzi scheme and defrauded people out of billions and billions of dollars okay but it also in the credits it also had stuff about like ceo disparity in terms of pay so it wasn't even about only ponzi scheme stuff it was it's more like corporate greed is bad, but I, I don't think it came across like that. Well, and you can see this movie, though, as a clear turning point in McKay's filmography because he does all these movies with, with Will Ferrell and directs them. And then his next three movies after this are the big short, Vice, Don't Look Up, much more political pieces. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you can see that this is kind of that turning point because Step Brothers has zero politics in it at all. <laughs> Talladega Nights had a little bit when it came to like uh, skewering like red state America and and kind of that southern grown home fried type of personality. But yeah, this is clearly this Madoff thing is clearly what inspired him to then make Big Short four years later. Right. Well, I found that, you know, reading some interviews about just Adam McKay in general, like 10 years later kind of thing. He he touches on the fact that they wanted to do a little bit with corporate greed and they want to talk a little bit about bailouts, but they wanted to do it in a way that was more less conspicuous, I guess. <laughs> but I, I think he was probably just getting his feet wet and not really sure what he was doing. And so for me, the second half of this movie really drags and it's because of the plot. And I'm not really a big fan of the ending. I didn't think it, it concluded in a way. And so as we're watching this movie, there were some really fucking laugh out loud funny moments throughout the first half. And there were still a lot of really funny moments throughout the rest of the movie. But it just kind of stops being fast paced because they try to focus on a plot that just felt convoluted in the first place. And it, it just has that smattering of comedy and silly moments that just get bogged down by the plot. And I, I think I would have liked it more if it had a more cohesive through line. You know, this movie actually made me think of Hot Rod, but Hot Rod had a very focused through line. It had a very purposeful goal, even though there were these like Lonely Island snapshot 
shorts. You know, this this movie, I was I was pretty bummed watching that second half because I felt like it deserved a little bit more. Yeah, and we've talked about this on the podcast before, where these comedies that try to satirize things can tend to lose the funny as as it goes along. Like we, we talked about with Walk Hard, like the third act is so much less funny than the first and second act. We talk about with Superbad and Knocked Up, like that's because these movies have to wrap up the plot that they've built. So it becomes very plot heavy in the third act and they lose focus on mm -hmm. the funny, which is kind of what drew us in in the first place. And I agree, like this movie... The first and second act had a lot of really funny shit in it. And then the third act, it was like, okay, we're just trying to get to the end now and we're doing whatever we can to close off these loops. Right. And they try to inject some funny stuff, but it just, it loses itself. And I hope in our search through this decade that we can find a movie that bucks this trend because there's got to be some examples of specifically action comedies being able to kind of carry the funny all the way through the movie. Yeah. I feel like you want to go out with a bang. So like if we shift from comedy to action for a quick second and analyze it from like, okay, when the helicopter blows up after the golfers <laughs> are like ordered by Will Ferrell to hit golf balls at the helicopter. Which first off, I don't think I could do that. And I'm a decent golfer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's definitely a suspension of disbelief that 40 <laughs> people would be able to just pelts them like dead on like <laughs> rapid fire like machine gun but i feel like that would be the climax of an action film because like you know next scene i think it is so, like we're at the bank 9 9 a.m or whatever and chris gethard's like do i press this enter key or not and like that's where that's where we're wrapping everything up so i think that it's doomed from the start with that sort of oh yeah ending. And then there's also that lull because they go to Steve Coogan's apartment or something, mm -hmm. you know, and they try to make amends with their loved ones, you know. Yeah, what, one more bribe. That was that was the <laughs> best line. He's like, $10 million a piece. It's not a bribe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. It's just even even in the third act, you're like, come on, let's just get out. My bad had to do with how we got in, which is I felt like we were just dropped into this existing relationship between Gamble and Hoyts, and it left me asking a lot more questions than I think the movie was prepared for me to be asking. Like, I think this movie would have been better had they met and have been instantly annoyed with each other than had this like maybe years long annoyance with each other all of a sudden mm, come okay. to a head in this movie. Like, it just felt very odd that their dynamic had already been established before I, as a viewer, got to, got a chance to meet them, and it, it made it feel a little off in the beginning. Now, once once that I learned a little bit more about them, I, I was more on board with it, but it's very jarring in the beginning for all of a sudden Wahlberg to snap at him for, like, singing his song, and it's like, I don't know why you're so upset with him. Like, I don't know the dynamic between you two yet, so it just felt a little weird. Yeah, I can definitely, definitely see that. I think I let it go the first time I saw it because I was just kind of along for the ride and just having a good time. But when you do look at it critically, I can see your point how it can be giant, especially when I think I haven't seen Step Brothers, but I know that the two brothers meet each other mm -hmm. because their parents get married and they have like that, you know, uh, conflict between each other. So and it's easier to do a movie where the two people are friends and we don't have to question their friendship. But when it's animosity towards each other, you have questions immediately. Like, what what was the impetus of this? Why are you guys so upset with each other? Like, your dynamic is off. Why is that? And mm -hmm. that's why conflict is usually introduced in the first act and not before the first act starts. Damn. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> My bad is uh, some character sort of decisions made by our two leads so when Wahlberg like throws coffee on Will Ferrell like even for a slapstick comedy I was like that seemed a little mean and weird didn't like that and then uh, Will Ferrell's failure blah it's a fucking hard name to say <laughs> <laughs> just spit it out blah <laughs> so Will Carroll <laughs> Fuck! <laughs> Will Ferrell's character, he was like an asshole about his wife. And I was like, this isn't 
necessarily that funny. Like, yeah. it they they kept hitting it, and I was like, it got a little funnier. But like at the end of the day, I was just like, I don't know. There's just a few decisions where it made me not like these extremely likable people. That's a fair point because I guess. I was just accepting of the fact that Will Ferrell had all these women attracted to him because they were doing a funny commentary on the fact that the plain looking guy always gets with the really hot girl in movies sort of thing. Like the Adam Sandler movies, which I haven't really seen many of them, but I've seen enough fucking previews because they're always on. <laughs> anyway, I it definitely rubbed me the wrong way, but I also kind of just accepted it. And I don't know why. I, I think that, I, again, I was just kind of along for the ride, and I knew that the movie itself was funny, and so I felt like it kind of redeemed itself. But at the same time, you're you're absolutely right. I, <laughs> As a woman, I should pick up on this shit a little bit more, but maybe it's because I'm used to women getting shit on. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was just felt weird and out of character. Maybe for like a Rob Riggles character, that could have made a little more sense. But, you know, we, they want us to like these people, yet these were just a few outlying sort of comedy sort of positions to take. So, you know, I think you're I think you're right, Emily, but like just a swing and a miss with like what those were. And mm -hmm. it was like a subtraction from what their actual character was, you know? Yeah, I do think that in the third act when it's revealed why he, he treats her like that. I do think in retrospect, you can kind of forgive a little bit of it because there is mm -hmm. character reason for it other than just, I'm going to shit on this woman. Uh, like there, there's something inside of him that makes him feel like he has to do that to protect himself from like, why is this beautiful woman with me? Like it's, it's an insecurity thing that kind of leads mm -hmm. it. But when we're first introduced to it, we don't have that information yet. And it, it was very off putting in the beginning, hearing him talk, about her like that with her sitting there or, or even if she weren't there, but just the way he talks about her was, I, I, I wasn't on board with that, that joke. And I guess that's kind of comedy, right? I mean, Matt, you're kind of the expert of, of well, that. I think it was a swing and a miss, you know, like it could have read well with, you know, the writers and where they were at and like, it could have made sense in the decision to do that. Even as the writer, though, if you know that that character twist is coming later, you can justify its inclusion in the beginning because right. you aren't necessarily seeing it linearly like everyone else is. Exactly. But like, I don't know. I still feel like it doesn't fit, even with like the Gator backstory, you know? And then also like, what's Mar Mark Wahlberg throwing coffee on Will Ferrell for? He could have slapped him and it would have been like just as funny um, where it's like, at least they, you know, they could be friends, but like, I don't know. It, it's weird, too, because like there's so many cutaways where it's clearly not, you know, real life. And like you, Emily said earlier, like we sh we are just going along for the ride. But that's just one of my bad. You know, I don't have a lot bad to say about it. All right. There really isn't a ton that is wrong with this besides, you know, the plot. <laughs> but all comedy movies are going to have moments where when you really nitpick at it, you're going to find something that doesn't read well to a general audience or that when you critically analyze it in, in a way you're going to find some way that it's going to offend someone obviously like there, there's always going to be something why don't we move on then to the weird did anything take you guys out of this movie there was really only one part that i didn't like and i think it was honestly rob riggle and damon wayans jr most most of the time i was on board with them like the desk pop was funny but later with them just kind of being continuous assholes, I just felt like it was superfluous, if that makes sense. It just seemed like they didn't need to be there. You know, it could have been a, more of a competition between the two pairs and maybe that movie would have been better. But it didn't seem like that was the goal. It was just extra that didn't need to be there. And so that was the only thing that I felt was a little weird. Yeah, I think uh, I think at the beginning, you know, they they had a nice little adversary, but towards the middle and end, it was more of like they're there to give out information or clues for Will Ferrell sort of mm -hmm. solving the case. Like, oh, we got eighty seven thousand in diamonds, and Will Ferrell's like, hmm, wait a second, and he puts pieces together. But I think you're right; this is a missed opportunity. Matt, you brought up the boardroom shootout. And that's my weird <laughs> in this movie. The yeah. Chechnyans and the 
Nigerians. It's Wahlberg sliding across the table while two groups of people on opposite sides are shooting at him. And he doesn't and get somehow shot. They can't shoot him. Like <laughs> that boardroom is not that big. It's not like there's it's not like a normal shootout where you can forgive them because they're, you know, 50 yards away and they're trying to shoot with a handgun. Like these are people like 10 feet away. <laughs> that threw me off because it's like, what are you guys aiming at if you're not shooting at him? Plot armor. <laughs> <laughs> And then also, anytime I see anything Trump advertised in movies, it takes me out of the movie now. It's just the nature of the beast. So the car crashing into Trump Tower at the beginning, I was like, I don't I don't need to see that. So it turns out they actually filmed a scene with Trump and Adam McKay's like, I don't remember. But basically, if you pay Donald Trump to do anything, he'll just do it. You know, seventy five hundred thousand dollars. And they filmed it. And it was because at that point, they never thought in a million years he would be president or even re- remotely relevant to anyone. It was just New York's way of saying he was the butt of the joke of everyone. And Adam McKay's like, nah, we don't need this. They got rid of it because they felt like it was just too much to have him in it. And I thought that was super funny. <laughs> they still have Trump Tower, though. They do still have Trump Tower. Right, yep. right. I mean, I giggled at that, but... Also, it was probably because I was just like, ha, ah, fuck you. <laughs> that was the only uh, reason. Yeah. As your resident New York City expert, you know, I have, that is Trump Tower. So <laughs> if there's any doubt. How did they do that, though? Like, I'm just curious because they had so many practical effects and, and whatnot throughout. And they actually filmed in New York. They filmed in a lot of places. And I just going i'm just sitting here going how did you do something like this i want to know that shot might have been a recreation on a, on a studio lot okay of like okay we've established that it's new york city now for this shot where the car crashes into trump tower now we'll just move it to the studio lot and you'll only see it. the bottom part of the building right so you can explode things without exploding things yep got it so my weird is uh is that uh there is no negative sentiment for the NYPD or it feels like yet or at least a I guess um I'd say consensus negative opinion of the police you know but having lived there and knowing how much money is spent on them now that's my weird is just like you know we got two protagonists that are like really likable you know they're destroying shit all over the city you know, and, you know, their budget is $5.2 billion <laughs> oh this God. year. So, oh God. you know, that's what I think of now is like, what the fuck are we spending our money on in New York City? Right. I think that you could definitely see that as weird, more reflecting on it now. But I think also Adam McKay and the writers captured on the fact that with with the jokes about the property damage from The Rock and Samuel L. Jackson and just the callousness of these two without any regard for anyone's safety, just trying, you know, when they fucking go into a bus with their car, they could have 100% killed a ton of people. They drive the bus with a ton of people still on, no regard for anyone's safety. And I think that it was partly to showcase just how dickish cops can be. But I don't think you would have really grasped on anything deeper until, you know, more even five, six, seven years later. Yeah. I don't even think it was satirizing how dickish cops could be. I think it was satirizing action movies. Oh, and okay. The, the, the massive destruction you see in these movies and then pointing out like, okay, you, you really though create cause like millions of dollars in damages. Like, I don't think it was actually a critique of, of police work. Yeah, Could be. And, I, and I will say, like, I don't know what it is in this film or this movie or whatever that, that sort of triggers that sort of weird feeling. And I don't blame the movie. I think it's still good. And I like, you know, but like when I think of like Die Hard, I don't necessarily think of all that stuff, you know, and it's the same. It's the same thing. You know, you got a detective taking on bad guys and, you know, the tower or whatever. So. I don't know what it is, but that's sort of what just triggered a weird for me. You know? mm-hmm. Final thoughts on this movie, and we're going to start with Emily. Put a cork in this thing, Emily. <laughs> okay. I had a great time. I think it definitely has some moments that shine through to make anyone laugh. I think it definitely has a lot of faults where I'm not going to sit down and watch this movie over and over again. 
even as like a comfort movie. But overall, had a good time. I recommend anyone that just likes this kind of humor, go for it. Give it a shot. Well, I just want to apologize to Ice T for mixing you up with Ice Cube. Um, <laughs> but great, great mo- movie, you know? And um, I think that this comedy is a great Will Ferrell movie, um, especially with Mark Wahlberg, that sort of flavor. But there are better ones out there. But this one's really good still. I would give it like, uh, you know, a B plus or, uh, or like a B maybe. But it's good. This is my least favorite Adam McKay movie. And that speaks more to how great his other movies, I think, are than the quality of this one, because I did enjoy this movie quite a bit. I I love the skewering of the action comedy that came before it. Uh, I love the the dynamic of Will Ferrell and Mark Wahlberg. And I, I do think there's a lot of standout funny moments in this movie, but something about it just prevents it from being that upper like that that jump up to the quality of Anchorman, Step Brothers, or Talladega Nights, which those comedies are some of my favorite comedies out there. What's your favorite idea? Mine is being creative. How do you get the idea? I just try to think creatively. Number one, we got the band back together again, Matt and Ben. So excited to have you and your buddy cop together. You both are getting yourselves killed by doing something stupid, though. What is it? They were cops, right? Yes. Mine's suicide. Um, oh, my God. <laughs> the both of you, though, right? You both. You, <laughs> oh, no. Because I was like, why did I become a cop? And, um, you know, I've seen some shit. So it was just time for me to. To to put put myself down. I see, That's probably ben, a terrible answer. You put Ben out of his misery, and then you kill yourself. Oh my god! <laughs> Murder suicide. <laughs> well, yeah, this is in reference to The Rock and Samuel L. Jackson doing something stupid and killing themselves. <laughs> okay, I hope Ben's is a little lighter than mine. Mine's a deep dish pizza of fucking sadness. <laughs> Heavy. <laughs> I don't know why that was so funny, but it was. Cops have a lot of downtime, and I think on our downtime, Matt and I, as teams, would play against the our rival uh, cop duo in Mario Party, and that would lead to us uh, at each other's throats, because Mario Party is a one-player game where you play <laughs> against everybody, uh, so our partnership would would not last through a game of Mario Party, and it would it would come to... Uh, a gun standoff. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> a little bit better than Matt's. It's okay. Can I change my answer to we went on a stakeout in a car and left the windows rolled all the way up during summer? <laughs> we both <died. laughs> I'm changing my answer. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> okay, number two. Matt and Ben, you have an accidental profession that you don't really realize what it is until your co-host explains it to you. Matt, what job does Ben have that he doesn't realize he has and vice versa? Well, I think that Ben, growing up, worked at Dakota, our local gym, and he worked in the locker room as a towel attendant. <laughs> but no. <laughs> but he also <laughs> I know where this is going. He also gave massages <laughs> on the benches and he had <laughs> he had a, he had a tip jar but <laughs> But he he thought it was just a regular uh, gym associate. That's that's as that's as far as I'm gonna go. You can use your imagination. <laughs> oh, what Ben does. That's as far as I'm gonna go. <laughs> okay, Ben, you get to now tell me what job does Matt have that he doesn't know he has. Well, I was gonna steal something from real life with this question. Oh. But now I don't. Now I don't know if I want to. Cause I, and if I want to go the mean route like he just did, <laughs> no, I'll go with 
So what's that uh, mean? It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> so, you son of a bitch. Um, after high school, Matt and I hung out a lot at his place, and uh, we played a lot of ping pong. And one day, his mom comes down, and she goes, "You guys play ping pong so much, you should start a ping pong business." <laughs> Without <laughs> elaborating on what that meant at all, so Matt um, would would start an accidental ping pong business, <laughs> not where he makes tables or trains people, but just plays ping pong seemingly for money, <laughs> like like in a hotel lobby, yeah, I'm right. just, like, like a piano show player up, in a hotel lobby. <laughs> and people would come and put dollar bills in a <laughs> plastic. <laughs> I love it. All right. Number three is in honor of our lion versus tuna situation. Are you ready? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I have a predator and I have some prey. It's going to be a little bit more convoluted. And so you have to tell me how your animal is going to destroy your opponents. And so I'm going to give you a rant. You can choose a number one through six. Three. Four. Now I want you to pick another number one through six. <laughs> shit this is complicated three four <laughs> okay <laughs> okay so matt mm-hmm. i want you to explain to me how ants are going to defeat an eagle i'm ants he's your an ants eagle. he's an eagle oh so ben's gonna get a different combination he's gonna he- get a different combination Oh, I see. Well, eagles notoriously have great vision, but what they can't see is us forming a line to guillotine their asses. <laughs> we're gonna start by we're gonna start by infesting every tree that they nest in, and we will destroy their homes, starting with their children, and they will be gone before you know it. <laughs> we work together. We are anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ben. In this scenario, Matt is a Komodo dragon, and you are a beaver. How is a beaver destroying a Komodo dragon? You're relying on my knowledge of Komodo dragons to. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. This. Jesus oh, Christ. what the fuck is that? I've heard of a kimono. That's a robe. <laughs> well, the only thing a beaver is susceptible to because of you know their their wood based diet and and lodging is fire. But a Komodo dragon doesn't have fire, <laughs> so they don't have to worry about that. But uh, what a beaver has are those teeth, and those teeth can, you know, gnaw through anything, including a uh, dragon. So really, once once the, the beaver develops the taste for dragon, he will be able to chew through it. So what we do as as beavers is first we construct wooden Komodo dragons uh, to, to, to practice the, the art of gnawing through one. And then once we've got fully trained, we just gnaw our way through them. Now that's all agree to never be creative again. I made a game for us today. And you made you a both, game. You both get to play. And it's called, I only learned it to make fun of you. <laughs> oh, dear. So in the movie, Mark Wahlberg reveals all of these skills he has, like ballet and harp, that he only learned so that he can make fun of people in his childhood. I'm going to give you someone, and you tell me what skill you would learn to make fun of them and why. <laughs> okay. We're going to go back and forth. A real person? Um, someone. Could okay. be. Could be. Could be real. Could be a movie character. Got it. Probably both. Matt, what would you learn to make fun of Indiana Jones? Uh, you know, I do whip tricks. <laughs> Can you give me a specific whip trick? Well, I would start to go overhead with the whip, and then I would, instead of like having a whip end, there would be a little hand out there, and I would slap Harrison Ford's butt. <laughs> To bully him, because that's what this is about, right here. Yeah, you, yeah, you're bullying him. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Or, or maybe I would take some of his like ancient books that are like just left in his office for months at a time, 
uh, and I use those like sort of like a what's it called where you throw clay pigeons in there and shoot with a shotgun. I do the same thing with like, his fancy books and whip it in midair and just <laughs> explode it. Because they're ancient <laughs> books, so they're basically just made of dust anyway. <laughs> Yeah, and the force you can get going with a whip. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so whip tricks to make Indiana Jones feel bad. Emily, what would you learn to make fun of Harley Quinn? I mean, I feel like the obvious answer is do some really shit cool gymnastics. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, I feel like really to make fun of her I would do like the most simple cartwheels into a bank, rob it easily, and then do a tiny cartwheel back. Okay, so you're <laughs> going to learn heists and just yeah. make them look super simple. Right, right. Okay. I'm not going to do elaborate gymnastics for it. I'll just do like my, my cartwheels are really bad where like my feet barely get over my head so, and my legs are super bent. So she's going to be real pissed. <laughs> yeah, she will. I would totally do like baby voice professional actor <laughs> <laughs> like a sag baby voice <laughs> matt how about james bond <laughs> oh let's see here um i would perfect how to cock block <laughs> <laughs> and i would follow him around and just get him not laid all the time <laughs> and i'd be like <laughs> Yo, dude, what what did you say the doctor had, gave you to take care of that thing? I got your chlamydia pills right here. <laughs> yeah, I'd be like wearing a tuxedo if I had to follow him into certain situations. But I just make sure you never got laid again. Matt, <laughs> I've known you for 20 years. I can say that you've perfected the art of the cock block. You don't need to learn anything else. <laughs> I don't. I don't know fancy parties though. It seems. <laughs> it seems like I'd be a fish out of water. You know, like basically getting called up into the majors. So there, there would definitely be an adjustment <laughs> for sure. But thank you. You're welcome, <laughs> <laughs> Emily. You get Anakin Skywalker. Oh, um, pod racing, obviously. But I would do it upside down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is pod racing. <laughs> you would be upside down in the cockpit or the entire ship would be upside down? Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. Both. <laughs> Riding your, your pod racer upside down yep. while you're on, the, you're on the bottom part of it. That's fucking wild. <laughs> Matt, what would you learn to make fun of Wesley? Oh. oh. How to have a liver. How to have a working <laughs> liver is the correct answer. Yeah. <laughs> That is the that is the first thing I thought of. But I was like, let's let's keep it one hundred. <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't. I don't think I would learn anything to make fun of Wesley. It doesn't feel right. Oh, whatever, Matt. I would. Uh, I think. I think I'm going to cop out on this one. I would rather Boo. just hang out with him and play Halo, land Halo parties, and uh, make big giant forts in his basement. So, okay, okay. I'm copping out officially. I'm sorry. That's okay. You lo you lose automatically, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, Emily, what would you learn to make fun of me? Be nice. It'll be funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think if Ben's good at anything. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I would get my master's or doc. No, I would get my doctorate in genetics just so I could show him up in literally anything related to biology and genetics. Just because I, I think that would be really funny to be like, well, my doctorate in genetics says for anything you say, literally anything. I don't. Do I talk about science that much? No. Okay. <laughs> I just think it would be funny. <laughs> Yeah, you'd be much better at Punnett Squares than me. There's no doubt about that. Um, it's weird because I immediately was like, I don't want to attack Wesley. But when you gave the question to Emily, I was like, I knew exactly what I would do <laughs> to make fun what, of you. What would you do? I, I would have I become better at trivia than him and make him feel <laughs> stupid. Wow. That would work. That would That's be so funny. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It's like something you're really good at. But it's not necessarily <laughs> crazy, you know, in the vein of like crazy. But like if I got good at trivia, that would make especially because of how 
how terrible <laughs> I am right now. <laughs> okay, Matt, last one. What would you learn to make fun of Emily? Maybe I like bought your house before you. And... <laughs> That's not something you <laughs> learn. So learn. I'd like I'd learn financial literacy and make a better offer on the house that you have now. I don't know. I'd learn to <laughs> swim. <laughs> yeah, there, there we go. Well, I don't. I feel like. Do you hang your hat on swimming, Emily? That was like <laughs> in the past. If you tried to learn to swim better than me, I would be very pissed. (laughs) But also, I think that's impossible, Matt. (laughs) No offense. I think it's impossible. No, 100%. I I have no... Even though it would be impossible for me to get better at trivia than Ben, I don't think, for some reason, becoming like a good swimmer seems even more impossible for me. And it's like, the other one's pretty far-fetched, so... (laughs) Yeah, swimming, swimming, that would be a good one. Please ask me to Emily, make fun of Matt. What are you going to learn to make fun oh of Matt? Oh my God, I would learn. I know what the answer is. How to get on Survivor after not seeing a single Survivor episode <laughs> instead of Matt. Winning Survivor, yeah. <laughs> I'd be pissed at any one of you guys. Emily, I do think that you should make a Survivor audition tape and get on the show. <laughs> Uh, just being like, I've never seen Survivor, but I've heard this is fun. Like, I want to try My friend it. Matt says yeah. that it's super fun, and I think it would be great. I'm a good swimmer. He's not. You'll remember Matt. He had the best audition tape you've ever seen. <laughs> Self-proclaimed. It's important to be cocky, I think. <laughs> it is. I don't definitely. know. It's what I've read. Well, thanks so much, guys, for talking about the other guys and having a great time. I really, really love you both so much. Wow, thanks. Next week, we are watching Rubber with our friends from Book Retorts, which I have no idea what this is. I don't know if we're talking about erasers rubber or we're talking about condoms rubber or we're talking about rubber trees. I don't know what's happening. Well, and I'll just say the less said about this movie ahead of time, the better. (laughs) <laughs> but i will say it's a horror movie oh and god. it takes place in the desert <laughs> oh god so that's what you get rubber horror movie <laughs> desert uh, an eraser truck transporting erasers explodes in the desert <laughs> a, tr- a truck full of condoms <laughs> <laughs> capsizes <laughs> come to life thank you everybody for listening please like rate subscribe share us with a friend or two and follow us on social media at idyp underscore podcast on twitter and instagram or you can email us at idrinkyourpodcast at gmail.com and before we go matt in your best Wahlberg accent or impression (laughs) end the episode by saying i drink your podcast i drink it up (laughs) let's see here um say say hello to your mother for me Uh, um, okay (laughs) Uh, i drink your podcast uh i drink it up (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what that, <laughs> that, that requires no discussion afterwards. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye.